in our study of the names of God, and we moved in from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and the uh, New Testament names of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, last week we looked at the name Jesus and the name Christ and those meanings. The second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me back up a minute. Uh, the Trinity itself is, is difficult for us to understand. There are lots of illustrations that have been given trying to help us to understand it. Uh, have three different persons, but they're all the same. Uh, the same essence, the same... Uh, they're all God equally. That's, that's difficult. That We don't have a lot of examples in life that give us that sort of an idea. But uh, down through the history of the church, uh, there have been a lot of different types of interpretations uh, trying to figure out exactly what it means that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, there have been a lot of wrong directions those interpretations have taken. And uh, those erroneous ideas uh, that arose during the first few centuries of, of uh, after Jesus' death and the resurrection, um, they were creating a lot of waves, a lot of uh, questions. And the, um, the church leaders would call what they call church councils. And they would uh, discuss these things and the, the leading theologians of the church, the leaders would come up with, uh, with ideas uh, from scripture and from the apostles teaching that would refute these erroneous ideas. Um, the most notable one was the Council of Nicaea in 325. It refuted the idea that, that uh, Jesus Christ was created. He wasn't really pre-existent, but he was a creature that God made. Maybe even the first creature God made. But that was refuted with the idea uh, with the Council of Nicaea. And the Council is a description of God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ being of the same substance with God the Father, that became a touchstone of Christian Trinitarianism. And most Christians have no difficulty accepting the idea that Jesus is co-equal with God the Father. But as you read scripture, you come across some terms that, that make you wonder that, uh, well, things like the Son of Man. What does the Son of Man mean? Or what does only begotten mean, or firstborn of the Father. Now all these kind of are a bit confusing if we take them at the English face value. But these three terms are the subject of our study this morning. We're going to begin with the Son of Man. Now our first thought when you think of the Son of Man is it will be talking about the humanity of Christ, that 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 God the Son became man. He became a son of man. But I found that this is really not the main meaning of this term. It's interesting that son of man was Jesus' favorite way of addressing himself, of, of, of saying, uh, instead of saying, I, Jesus, he could say the son of man. In fact, he used 80 times. 80 times in the Gospels, he referred to himself as the Son of Man. 31 times in Matthew, 13 in Mark, 24 in Luke, and 12 in John. The reason that Jesus used this term takes us back to the book of Daniel. So if you'll open your Bibles to the seventh chapter of Daniel, we'll find out the background of what Jesus was meaning when he called himself the Son of Man. We'll begin reading in the first verse, and we're going to set the scene for what uh, for what Daniel is 
speaking about here. It's a vision that Daniel had. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. And he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion, had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked. It was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. And behold, another beast, the second one, resembling a bear. It was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth, and thus it's, they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying. Extremely strong, it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder of it at its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten, ten horns. And while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn and a little one came up among them. Three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. Behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great bellies. How would you like to have a dream like that? I'm not sure I could get back to sleep after something like that. Daniel was recording this, this vision he had of four terrifying beasts coming out of the sea, and each one was different. The first was a lion with wings, and second a bear-like creature, third a swift leopard, and the fourth a ten-horned beast Dreadful and terrible, extremely strong, with, with large iron teeth. Like earlier vision that was explained in Daniel, these four beasts represented the four successive kingdoms of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And if you look at each one of those beasts, you see the characteristics that were of those four empires. But after this revelation comes words describing God the Father, the, the Ancient of Days, on his heavenly throne. Okay, let's read verses 9 and 10. And I kept looking until the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A river of fire was flowing before and was flowing and coming out from before him, and thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and all the books were open. Have a, a scene of judgment there, and it's uh, a scene of going into the future where God is sitting on his throne. A book of judgment is opened, and the beast, which we know from the book of Revelation is the Antichrist, is slain. Verses 11 and 12, and I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, his body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. Talking about the end times, talking about the judgment of the Antichrist, slain and consigned to the lake of fire. And now, with this background comes the passage giving Jesus his name, Son of Man. Verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, 
His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Son of man, the Son of God is presented as the king. And dominion over everything was given to him. The Son of Man is a messianic title describing the giving of dominion, glory, and a kingdom by the Father to the Son. It describes a future everlasting kingdom which will not pass away in contrast to all these other major kingdoms. You see, he went through the history. He went through Babylon. He went through Persia. He went through Greece and Rome. But then here comes the Ancient of Days and he gives to the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, dominion over all, an everlasting kingdom. The others passed away. This kingdom will stay forever. And Jesus takes this term, the Son of Man, Messiah, and says, and used it 90 or 80 times in reference to himself. In other words, he's saying, every time that this is used, it's saying, I am Messiah. For example, listen to Matthew 9, 6. And you can go through, it's a wonderful study. Matthew 9, 6. These words were spoken after the healing of a paralyzed man. But that you may know, in fact, this was the story that, that Lauren was talking about. But you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, Rise, take up your bed, and go home. That you may know that the Son of Man, that the Messiah, can forgive sins, that I am God, and only God can forgive sins, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. In chapter 24 of Matthew, this is what's called the the little apocalypse is in contrast to the whole book of Revelation that Jesus is talking about the end times in Matthew 24. Jesus uses the term six times to describe his second coming. Verse 27, For just as a lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. The second coming of Christ. We see Jesus using the term Son of Man in verses 30, where he, where he quotes the Daniel passage, 37, 39, and 44. One further example, one of only 80, is found in the first chapter of John. Turn to John chapter 1. Starting in verse 51, right at the very end of the chapter. Well, actually, let's start in verse 47 to give us some context here. This is the calling of one of the disciples, Nathaniel. Nathaniel is also Bartholomew if, if in other, other uh, readings. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, you do believe? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Nathaniel was confessing that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, King of Israel, in which, to which Jesus replied as he described himself as the pathway between heaven and earth between man and God. Greater things you're going to see. You're going to see the gospel lived out and the gospel fulfilled. You're going to see that I am becoming, I will become the pathway between heaven and earth. The one who reconciles God to man. And all these times, if you look at each one of these 80s, Jesus used Son of Man, He was using it to claim and give claim as the Messiah. 
He was claiming the divine privilege, the right to forgive sins. He set new rules regarding the Sabbath and fulfilled the prophecies of his suffering, his death and resurrection. No one else ever in Scripture addresses Jesus as the Son of Man. Jesus only himself used this because he was saying, I am the Messiah. That's the meaning of the Son of Man. Another term which relates to Jesus' origin is only begotten. John 1.14 said, And the Word became flesh, and the flesh dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, sir, now usually when we think of the, of the word begotten, it's not a common word that we use every day, but we, we think of a root word, uh, the idea behind it is, is begat. In genealogy found in scripture, we find that a father always begat his son, you know, the that Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat all the twelve, his twelve sons. It's the idea of a father giving birth to a son that succeeds him. But this is really a most misleading translation, for the Greek word speaks of uniqueness, the only one of its kind, and that's the meaning of begotten. John MacArthur says of this term, the, the term only begotten is a mistranslation of the Greek word monogenesis. The word does not come from the term meaning beget, but instead has the idea of the only beloved son. It therefore has the idea of singular uniqueness, of being beloved like no other. It therefore has the idea of of a character relationship between the Father and the Son and the Godhead. It doesn't connote origin, but rather unique prominence. So when it's talking about the only begotten, it's meaning the only one, the unique one, the one of great prominence. I had to smile when Billy read Psalm 2. Because that's one of the main passages which talks about this. Psalm 2, 7 and 8. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. The ends of the earth for your possession. So in addition to the verse speaking of the future earthly kingdom of Christ. It speaks of a particular time and event. Today. I have begotten you. An event related to the coming kingdom. So to find out what event this is talking about, what time this is talking about, we can find the answer in Acts chapter 13. When uh, I was telling uh, Mary what scripture to put down, you know, all I could say was various because there's a lot of them. The chapter 13 of uh, we find here Paul's sermon in a, in an Asian city called the city in Antioch, which is different from Syrian Antioch. That was what the church and the city of the church that sent out Paul and Barnabas originally as missionaries. Uh, I'll begin reading in chapter in uh, verse 30 of Acts 13. This is in his sermon. He says, But God raised him from the dead, meaning Christ, of course. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the Father that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus as also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. So the day that 
Jesus, that God said, today I've begotten you, has to do with the resurrection of Christ. It not only is just the incarnation of Christ, but that was the beginning, and all of his ministry culminated in the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus completed his work of redemption through his offering of the final and complete sacrifice for our sins. And having completed that work, by sacrificing his life on the cross, he was raised from the dead, and Jesus triumphantly returned to heaven, taking his right hand at the taking his seat at the right hand of the Father. Today I have begotten you. Today I have exalted you, and God is speaking, I have exalted you, Jesus, as the unique, only Son of God, the one of preeminence the one who will receive the inheritance. The name only begotten is best seen as Jesus, as describing Jesus' completed work as he's exalted as the only unique Son, the only one. As God the Son became the Messiah, the God-man, and lived a sinless life, thus qualifying him to be the sinless sacrifice and the perfect sacrifice. Only God as man. God cannot die. But the God man, that's why Jesus had to be, why the Son of God had to become human so he could die, so he could be the sacrifice. His resurrection proved Jesus was the promised Messiah. In fact, Jesus based everything that he was and said on the fact that he would be raised on the third day. It was as if he was saying, if that doesn't happen, you can ignore everything I said. But if I am raised from the dead, that will prove that I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. I am the promised one from the, new, from the Old Testament. There's a third term that often has been mistaught as saying Jesus was created, and that's the term firstborn. Now Jesus was born in the same manner as all of us, but the term firstborn is speaking not of birth, but of position, of preeminence, the right of inheritance of all creation. The firstborn in the Jewish culture and in many other cultures too, received the inheritance. He was the one who carried on the family name. He was the one who became the leader of the family. And that's what it's talking about when it says Jesus was the firstborn, that he has the role of inheritance. He has the role of leadership. He existed before all creation, was the agent of creation, as John 1.3 States where it says all things came into being through him, and by virtue of being the firstborn is exalted in rank above all creation. Again, we return to Psalm 2 7, but we have 8. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said today, said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. And God is saying, as the firstborn, as having that role and fulfilling that role, you will rule over all creation. Jesus will take the exalted position of the King of Kings over all the earth that is set to come. Looking at several verses where firstborn is used is used. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus is the most notable, the first of all, the preeminent one. This relates to him also being the head of the body, the head of the church. He's the divine groom of his bride, the church. He is the preeminent one. He's also called the firstborn of all creation in Colossians 
The word for firstborn can refer to the first child born in a family, but most often it speaks of preeminence and position of rank. The firstborn. Much like only begotten. In position and right, Jesus is number one. As we read the passage, it becomes very clear that Jesus was not created. In fact, I think that's the last one we'll, we'll turn to. Look at Colossians chapter 1. And verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, this is one of the primary passages speaking of who Jesus was. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body of the church, and he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to that first place in everything. Jesus Christ cannot be both the creator and be created. He can't be both. He's a creator. Verse 18 speaks that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Meaning he was the first one to be bodily resurrected to never die again. You see, Lazarus, the daughter of Jairus, uh, and one other were resurrected by Jesus. They came back to life from the dead. But they had to die again. Jesus was the firstborn. The first one who was resurrected who will never die again. It says in 1 Corinthians that he was the first fruits of those who were raised. In other words, he was the first one who we're all going to follow. We are going to be raised too. He was like the first tomato of the season. The promises is that all the other tomatoes are going to be coming. He is the first one who all of us are going to be resurrected, never to die again. So what does all this mean? Well, one, one thing it means is that it proves that Jesus is God, that he was not created. And anyone who says he was just simply doesn't understand what these terms mean. We know that Jesus has, has existed eternally. And because he is what he said he was, what he said about believing in him, that in him have, we have eternal life. We can believe that too. If Jesus was who he said he was, and he was, then his words were true. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Believing, putting your trust in him. As a son of God, He's worthy of our worship. He led the way in conquering death. In other words, we don't have to fear death. It's one of the main fears that people have. It's amazing how people resist dying. And that's just part of our humanity. But as Christians, we don't have to fear death. Like that's something actually we look forward to because that ushers us into the presence of Christ. The word says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So Jesus conquered death. And we're going to, each one of us is going to have a resurrected body in which there's not going to be any sickness or any weakness or any, you know, can you imagine living and never getting tired? Never getting sick, never getting old. What a wonderful future we have. If you know Christ, there's an empty tomb. Jesus is not there. You can go to the tomb of, of all the other founders of world religions. You can't go to the tomb of Jesus. You can go to where they think it might have been, but it's empty. 
There's nobody there. No bones there to look at. As a man, Jesus was the first one to be resurrected then to die again. And that's our hope. The hope of Jesus' return, the hope of eternal life, the hope of a resurrected body in which there's no pain or aging or any of the problems that we have here. A new world. Boy, we have a lot to look forward to. So we can rejoice. And all the little minor things that happen to us in life, we can just write them out they're not going to be important. We won't probably wait to remember them, you know, for all eternity. What a hope we have. Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah, prophesied and fulfilled all those prophecies. He is God. Shall we pray? Father, we rejoice in your word that tells us about Jesus that tells us that he was the first, the creator, the preeminent one, the one who deserves all honor and all glory. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we can know him, that we can have eternal life as we put our trust and our faith in him. We thank you that our sins can be forgiven. Father, each of us is imperfect. Each of us sin. As sin, we are sinners by nature and sinners by practice. And Father, you forgive that sin. And Jesus was a perfect sacrifice. He paid the debt that we owed. And now we can have eternal life. We can look forward to a resurrected body. We can look forward to eternity with you. The source of all goodness and love. Thank you for this. It's all because of Jesus. And we thank you. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the one who is our creator. And we honor him. And we pray in his name. Amen.